Good morning. Welcome to Knox. In what seems to be like a March morning, but it's only January 8th. Um, and we will trust God what he's doing with the weather. Uh, there is some frost in the ground, uh, but it is mildish. Um, I, I guess of the announcements that we have this morning is thank you for everyone who contributed and helped out at Coffee Chat on Wednesday. It was a great success. And we were left with um, some websites and resources for being great grandparents. Um, so, and we thank, I think, had a wonderful speaker in uh, Nancy's sister and uh, her, her life experiences. Uh, a couple thank yous have been uh, forwarded our way. Uh, to the awesome cookie bakers of Knox Presbyterian, thank you so much for the delicious homemade baking you all work so hard to make for, for Mac students. It is so appreciated. Thank you so much. Uh, I think it's from Allison is uh, the signature there. There is another uh, note, uh, eight and a half by 11 typed message downstairs on the bulletin board, if you make your way down there, with more details of what they're doing uh, with the um, uh, Mac student ecumenical uh, chaplaincy. Thank you. Uh, just more details that, that might be of interest to, to some of you. It's quite varied. Uh, and then also thank you uh, to members of Knox Presbyterian. Thank you for the lovely gift basket full of goodies. Your kindness is appreciated. Linda, and that is our treasurer uh, for, for, from Christmas. Any other announcements that need mentioning at this point? Very good. All right. Where are you coming from this morning or this week? Has it been sort of your last week of Christmas vacation and today is just a, a continuation, your last day of rest before going back to work tomorrow? Has it been a busy week where everything has started up again and you've been meeting deadlines all week? Has it been a lonely week? Has it been a week of recovery, contemplation? Jesus said, Matthew eleven twenty eight. 28, come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart. And you will find rest for your souls, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Let us join together this Sabbath morning, accept the invitation and sing together 10,000 reasons. Mm -hmm. Remain standing, thank you. Uh, thank you to Peg for helping uh, choose uh, a number of the songs this week. I appreciate the uh, assistance. Uh, Thank you to all those who have already uh, submitted their offering at the, the front uh, in the basket and to those who, who have uh, chosen to give through PAR or e-transfer or the other number of ways that there is to give. We thank you for that and uh, let us ask a blessing on those, those gifts that you've provided and for this, this week. Surely the arm of the Lord is not too short to save, nor his ear too dull to hear. But your iniquities have separated you from your God. Your sins have hidden his face from you, so that he will not hear. If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray, and seek my face, and turn from their wicked ways, then will I hear from heaven, and will forgive their sin, and will hear, heal their land. We thank you, Lord, for your promise of forgiveness. We thank you for the gifts that you have blessed us with and in turn we have offered for your work here within this congregation, but most importantly, for your kingdom, for your family, 
beyond these walls. Thank you, Lord. Amen. This is the air that we breathe, that we have been given. Let us sing together. This is the air I breathe. Our scripture today is from, oh, sorry, no, no, I, yes, it's from John 2, 1 to 12. But we have the Big God Project version of our scripture this morning. There's a wonderful beauty in confessing that need to God of needing him. And especially when we come into prayer, we humble ourselves in that sense of acknowledging that we need him in everything, not, not only to ask him for things or to have him enter into our lives, but even we need him so that we can direct our praise and thanksgiving. And so I invite you, if there's anything that you would like to share, or a testimony or a, a praise or a concern, then I invite you to do that. I'm very grateful to see Laverne back with us after uh, a long bout with illness, so we're very thankful for that. Any others this morning? As I pray, uh, I will say, God, in your mercy, and if you could respond together, hear our prayer. Let's come. Loving God, you invite us to bring you our doubts, our fears, our joys, concerns, our petitions, and our praise. We thank you that you are with us in every circumstance and that you walk with us through times of celebration and sorrow. This day we open our hearts to you, knowing your spirit prays in us and through us with sighs too deep for words. Where people are tired from work or weary from responsibility, where time and resources feel inadequate, especially as costs rise and are overwhelming. Send your spirit with strength and renewal. God, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Where people are facing danger, living under duress, where people are persecuted for who they are, where they live, or what they believe, send your spirit with courage and comfort. God, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Where people have suffered the loss of love or purpose, and where love seems complicated and challenging, send your spirit to bind up the brokenhearted. God, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Where people are ill and worry for their future, where people suffer pain or disability and long for healing, you know where each of us are at, you know those that we carry on our hearts this morning for brothers, for sisters, for spouses, for children, for parents, O oh God, all who are dependent in different ways because of their needs. For those who need your light to shine upon them that we carry in our hearts, would you call them? For those who need healing, we pray your healing. For those who need comfort, we pray your comfort. Where people face the limits of life and options, feel like they have run out, send your spirit with healing and hope. God, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Where people seek a reliable friend, a true comforter, or a wise advisor. Where the lonely long for company to cheer. And where isolation makes people doubt their value to others. Send your spirit of wisdom and companionship. God, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Where new life is beginning and hope dawns, where there is laughter and joy, healing and transformational change, where there is good news to celebrate and opportunities to open the year ahead, send your spirit with rejoicing and gratitude. God, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We thank you, almighty God, creator, redeemer, and sustainer. We thank you for all that you are and who you are and make us a blessing to all whom we encounter through the life of Christ that lives in us. Amen.
someone had, had sent me a little uh, joke a while ago, and um, I don't know how appropriate it is, but, you know, here we go. Last week, outside the liquor store, I found $50 laying on the ground, but nothing to identify who lost it or who owned it. So I pondered over what I would do. Do I hand it to the clerk or treat it as a windfall and pocket the money? I then thought to myself, like any good Christian would, what would Jesus have done? So I promptly walked into the liquor store and turned the $50 into wine. Anybody coming over later? <laughs> you know, we, we, we look at that um, Jesus turning water into wine, and if, if we look at the scripture heading, um, not the biblical writer themselves, John, had put the heading in. Rather, it was biblical translators or editors. And, and they put the heading in, Jesus turns water into, into wine. And so the question is, is the story really about a miracle? And, and why is it that Jesus does miracles? Can he only do it when people have faith? For instance, in Mark 5, Jesus says when he comes to his hometown, he was not able to do any miracles because they lacked faith. Well, are miracles really dependent on what we do? And what does that say about the power of God? The question may not be this morning, why does Jesus do miracles? But rather, what is it that miracles accomplish? Why does he use them? And, and how might they have transformed people? And how might these biblical stories transform us? Imagine, if you will, that we receive a letter to Knox Presbyterian from the Apostle Saul, now called Paul. Are you going to open that letter? You know, you've, you've already heard that this guy's gone around and he's persecuted Christians. He's arrested them. He stood by while they stoned Stephen. And, and now he wants to write a letter about the love of God and how you should follow that love. Or let's say you get a letter from Levi, now called Matthew. I mean, everyone knows, uh, as a fellow Jew, he was considered a betrayer because he was a tax collector. He, he was collecting tax for Caesar rather than temple tax. And it's well known that tax collectors will extract that money any way that they can, and most of them skim a little off the top for themselves. Would you read his letter? You see, human nature right away tells us, don't trust thieves and murderers. It makes sense. It's difficult to believe that the broken, the lost, the sinning, the murderers people can change. Everything in our experience says, don't trust them. But Paul and Matthew were transformed by Jesus Christ. And having received that incredible grace of transformation, they followed Jesus and, and sought to nurture their transformational growth. Paul, for instance, disappears for three years, and, and we learn that he just spent time learning from God and maybe studying the scripture. He, he, he allowed himself to be transformed into a new life. Have you ever heard the saying, the grass is greener where you water it? It makes sense, doesn't it? This past summer it was super dry. And I'm going out into my garden every morning and evening, watering the plants. Because, you know, it took me a long time to propagate those seeds. I want something good to come out of it. The amazing thing was that the grass around it stayed like dead brown. Which maybe was a good thing. I, I guess I could have watered it, but an acre of lawn is a bit much. I was rather thankful that I didn't have to pay for gas money to, to mow the lawn. That was a bit of a relief. Well, the, the same is true of nurturing the presence of Jesus in our life. Grace says, and Scripture tells us, God is with us no matter what. He never leaves us. A transformation, however, continues to take place as we nurture that relationship. You know, for instance, well, I'll get to that in a minute. This morning, we, 
we read a story and we see that many people were transformed. And not just by the miracle itself. First, first we see Mary. Yeah, we've just come out of the Christmas nativity story and we read there that, that Mary pondered all of these things and treasured them in her heart. She had all this knowledge that her son was the son of God and angels came to her and he was the Messiah and all that. And, and she just, wow, this is, this is like a lot of information. And, and she sat with it. And for the last 30 years, Mary has been a mother, the diaper changer, the discipliner, the guide, the supper maker, the, you know, advisor. When I was visiting my mom one time, I, I said something kind of silly, and she, she kind of reprimanded me, and I thought, you know, I'm an adult. You can't tell me what to do. And my mother just looked at me, and she said, yeah, I'm still your mom. You know, once a mother, always a mother. But when we look at this story, we see that Mary removes herself as mother and she becomes a trusting disciple. And running to Jesus, she says, oh, the bridegroom has run out of wine and it's only day three of seven. Think about that. That's like going to a wedding that you've been invited to and a hundred people are there, let's say, and six or seven of them get this fantastic meal and there's not enough for everyone else. Well, what are you going to think? Now, you're not going to look too favorably on the bride or the bridegroom. Now, what kind of party are they throwing here anyway? Mary comes to Jesus and she basically is saying, do something, you're the Messiah, save this family from disgrace. And how does Jesus respond? It seems rather harsh at first. What, what do you, why do you involve me? It's not my problem they ran out of wine. But Jesus is not dissing his mother here. He's, he's actually prompting her faith. It's an invitation. Why does Mary involve him? Because all these things that she has pondered in her heart, she's now throwing out as faith. She knows that he's the Lord, and he can do something about it. Jesus' question, why do you involve me, prompts her to trust. And so she turns to him, and rather than, uh, or turns back away from him, and rather than responding to his question, she just turns around and continues right on in this faithful, trusting thing. Servants, do whatever he tells you, she says. I once heard someone ask the question, what good is knowledge if you fall into the trap of always learning and never getting around to implementing what you have learned? I want to say I, I believe deeply that all of you have been transformed already by the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ. I mean, why else would you give up every Sunday and come and worship and praise him and walk with him? And like Mary, maybe you're pondering all the knowledge that you receive Sunday after Sunday or from your own scripture reading. And, and you take your prayers to him. And when Jesus responds to your prayers and he asks the question, why are you involving me? How will you answer? You see, this is a transformational question prompting your faith. Do you believe that Jesus knows what to do, how to do, when to do something in response to your prayers? Do you believe in the lordship of Jesus Christ over your life and that he will meet your deepest need? Well, second, being transformed by the grace of Jesus takes participation and obedience. For, for instance, you, you decide you're going to try out for a hockey team or a badminton team, or maybe some of you are in a shuffleboard outside nowadays, and, and you get on the team. That's a grace. You're in. You're part of the team. It's a done deal. What you can't do now is sit on the bench and go, well, I hope the coach just keeps on transforming me 
so that when I'm ready to play, I'm the best player. No, 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 no. You're going to nurture. You're going to water that gift. You're going to listen to the coach, and the coach is going to say, you got to get up. you got to do push-ups. you got to do a run. You've got, and none of it seems to have anything to do with the game you're playing, but it's all getting you in shape and ready to play the very best. We need to obey. And I realize we don't really like that word, obey. It has connotations of, oh, you've got to submit. You know, very few weddings anymore say love, honor, and obey. It has connotations of submitting to someone else when we really desire to oversee our own life and do things how we want Sometimes even our prayers are directed to God. This is what I need, this is what you should do, and this is what the outcome should be. The servants at the wedding feast were one of the few people who knew what was actually happening. Most of the guests had no clue. The bridegroom had no clue that they had run out of wine. So I wonder why it is that they just obey Jesus when he says, Go take six large jars, that, and it, it sh in the scripture it tells that there are about 20 gallons each. We're talking big jars, and they were used for ceremonial cleaning. In other words, before a meal or before certain aspects of the wedding, people would wash themselves. Now, I don't know about you, but even if I had sunlight antibacterial dish soap and clean those jars, I don't want to be drinking out of them. So I wonder if the servants obey and go, hm, this is going to be kind of a fun joke. You know, let's disgrace this guy who doesn't have the nerve to provide enough wine. Like, is that what Jesus is up to? And Jesus tells them, take a cup of water and, and bring it to the master of the feast. So there's two reactions. Either they're like, well, this will disgrace him, this will teach him. You know, he runs out of wine. Here, here's your, more of your wine. Water, ha-ha. Or, maybe if I were the person to do that, I'd be shaking in my boots. I'm just a servant. Here, the, the master of the wedding is asking for wine. I'm bringing him a cup of water. But guess what? The servants do it. They obey Jesus. It begs the question for myself, maybe for you. Are you willing to step into obedience even when it's uncomfortable, silly, like playing a game and jumping up and down in church? Or, or letting your neighbors know that you go to church? Or letting them know that you love Jesus? What, whatever it is. Are you willing to take the risk to do what Jesus asks? You see, you or my transformation will not happen unless we surrender to Jesus. What lies might you believe that need to be transformed with Jesus' truth? What things do you know that God is calling you to give up for righteousness, that is, right doing? What decisions do you make and you don't ask God about it? Uh, what would you do, what silly things do you do to follow Jesus that culture says, are you out of your tree? I want to just reiterate again, salvation is a gift from God. You are saved. He loves you. When, when you receive by grace and faith through baptism and communion, you know that you are loved and you receive all that God has given. But we are very remiss if we take on an attitude that says, what, shall I keep on sinning because God has covered me with grace? Absolutely not. You see, there are many times in Scripture where, where it's, it's noted, make every effort to transform into Christ-likeness. That means you are not the same today as you were tomorrow. Other way around. What steps can you take? 
I want to have a quick look at Ephesians 4, verses 22 through 24, and, and maybe some practical ways for you to think about transformation. You see, verse 22 says, everything of your old life, that's got to go. Whatever you were doing before you met Jesus that isn't in line with Christ or God's will, you, you got to start working at getting away with it. It's true. It's, it's not going to happen overnight. It's going to take time. And, and there's going to be moments where you stumble. So analyze, think about, ponder in your heart and take action. What in your life are you aware that doesn't align with God's desire for you? What of your unredeemed nature do you carry through every day rather than the will of God? Verse 23, you've got to change the way you're thinking. You know, you can ask me, hey, how are you doing? I'll say, fine. My first thought in my head was, miserable. But I'm not going to let you know that. But God wants me to know that. God wants me to deal with that. The stuff that nobody sees. To go deep within I love to pray Psalm 139 regularly. Create in me a clean heart, O God. Renew a right spirit within me. That has to do with my inner attitude, my inner thoughts, the renewing of my mind, how I approach uh, everything that I do. So that I, I can seek God's will and change over my thinking, my anger, my, my selfishness, or even how I process hurt. Verse 24, Paul is saying, you know, what, what you nurture, what you're watering, that's what's going to grow. And sometimes we spend a lot of time doing things or thinking things that aren't of God. And guess what? That's just going to keep growing in your life. You got to put on the new self. Nurture true righteousness and holiness. And those words are directly related to our behavior, our morality, our attitude. It's about placing our will under God's will. And when we do that, that actually releases God's transformational power in your life. If you're not willing to work with him, he, 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 all he can do is give you the words. And all you can do is listen. But when you say, I listen and I want to follow and I'll intentionally obey, then his spirit can say, okay. Do you need peace in a relationship? You need to calm down a temper. There, uh, is there too much drama, trauma, or fear in your life? Are you feeling joyless, shame? Here Jesus prompt you. Why do you involve me? And then in faith answer him. Well, third, the result of any miracle is, is that it transforms. Not just water into wine. That's, that's pretty cool. I've, you know, I can do a magic trick like that, that it looks like I've turned water into wine doesn't taste like wine, but it looks like it does. Know that Jesus offers you the very best when you ask. It was, the story says, the best wine ever. It was a wedding that would be remembered forever. You can actually still go to Cana today and be at the place of the wedding as far as they know. That wedding has gone down in history for over 2,000 years. Best wedding ever. Jesus saves the best for last. That ongoing transformation in which you look more and more like Jesus. It revealed his glory, says the text. That Jesus is the Son of God. And his disciples that had begun to follow him now believed. This is the Son of God. Will you believe in him? 
Will you come to Jesus and expect in faith that he can and will do something with your brokenness, your pain, your inner struggle? Will you choose to obey and take steps to participate in his, with his spirit to transform your life? Will you put your faith in him and involve him in every aspect of your life? Transformation is an incredible thing. And it frees us from so much pain. This is why Jesus brought miracles. And we see that miracle happening in our lives day by day. And we'll see more of that if we would but let him. Let's, let's pray. Heavenly Father, what an incredible gift of grace you have given us in the Lord Jesus Christ. We are so humbled that even now, no matter where we're at, the things we've done, the way we think, the things we're involved in, the things we do out in the open or even in the secret, you know them all. And yet you love us. And you died for us. And, and we have received that promise in faith. That no matter what we do, you love us deeply. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for that incredible grace. And we recognize, Lord, that, that we still have struggles, that, that there are things in our life that, that we know aren't right. And so we pray, Holy Spirit, that you would create a new spirit within us. That you would make our hearts clean that you would give us strength and desire to change what we are able to by the grace of your spirit, that we may continue to be transformed, that we are never the same today as we were yesterday, but always growing. We thank you for your profound patience as we come again and again say, shucks, did it again, or didn't do it didn't follow your will. Lord Jesus, today we want to answer the question, why do we involve you? We involve you, Jesus, because you are our Lord, our Messiah, our Redeemer, and we trust you. Thanks be to God. Amen. We continue to confess that our transformation continues not because of what we've done, but because of what Christ has done through us. Let's sing. And the Lord who says, why do you entrust me? And answer his call, that he can do immeasurably more than you ever thought or imagined. Go now in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.